Thank you, Ms. Bridget Gabriel. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce my learned colleague, first and foremost, Mr. Mark Langfan of our Roots Sheva, the UN correspondent and also security analyst. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gorgi. First of all, I have to say it's kind of hard to, to <laughs> even <laughs> try to, uh, you know, do better than those two guys, guys and gals. Uh, but I'm going to try. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone here, thank everyone who came, and I want to thank His Excellency Dr. Otto. Uh, all I can say is thank you on behalf of the Jewish people, thank you on behalf of Israel, and thank you on behalf of someone who uh, all I can say is you are a special person and your country is a special country. Now, now, what I want to do is I want to give, I believe, some lines of contact between what His Excellency Ron Pressor said and what Bridget Gabriel just said. And what I want to do is really enable everyone here to be able to go to his next door neighbor and in a calm, clear way explain how Israel's fight today will be the world's fight tomorrow. And I've put together a PowerPoint as well as a couple of pamphlets. So everybody, you don't have to worry, almost all the graphics that are up there are in these pamphlets. So uh, don't worry about it, okay? First of all, I'd like to give a little news context to uh, my talk in that last week Defense Minister Ya'alon said a West Bank withdrawal will lead to rocket and mortar fire on Ben Gurion Airport. He also said that Israel should look for a diplomatic process outside the box and he mentioned newfound strategic interests shared with moderate states. Now I just want to make a, a qualifi qualifying statement in that I'm not representing the Israeli government and I'm not presuming to say exactly that this is what he meant in my talk. But the facts and the maps that I'm about to show you, I believe will give you a qualitative matrix to be able to understand better what is being talked about in the news. Now, the, the short one, is Israel today, the world tomorrow. Now that's a pretty dramatic statement, right? Well, in 1938, you had anti-Semitism. And I think it would have been a little bit difficult to go from 1938 anti-Semitism to 1939 and 1940 Nazi Blitzkrieg. However, today, as my uh, two predecessors explained, anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism. And what I hope to show you in the next uh, little time is what I believe is a straight and direct line from 2014 anti-Zionism to an Islamist sweep south and east into the moderate Sunni oil states, as well as an Islamic sweep westward into Europe. And how am I going to show that? I'm going to show that through maps. But I would be remiss if I did not explain the picture on the left. And the picture on the laugh, left is it was a 15-year-old boy by the name of Daniel Viflik. He was going to school near the Gaza Strip. And a terrorist, very similar to the one who you can see in that little picture with the rocket, fired an anti-tank rocket into his yellow school bus and killed him. So just wanted to sort of dedicate this talk to Daniel Viflik. Now, how am I gonna 
go from Israel today, the world tomorrow? Well, I'm going to sort of go back in history to 1581. And the map, the first map up on the screen, is not my map. It was a map done by Heinrich Bunting. And what he showed in this map, in uh, almost 100 years after Columbus discovered America, was he saw the world as Asia, Europe, and Africa. The new America had just been barely discovered. And he believed that Jerusalem, the Levant, was in fact the crossroads of all of these continents, and it was sort of the node through which you got from Asia to Europe and Europe to Africa, as well as Asia to Africa. And so what I believe is this map, in many ways, sums up the strategic importance of Israel in that it is the gateway, it is the controlling node through which, if God forbid ISIS were able to break, it would go everywhere. Now that might seem like a very traumatic statement, but let's go to my first map that I've made. And in this map, and by the way, everyone's got to forgive me, my, I, I had an Apple failure in that I had a, uh, a pointer, uh, but it's not working, so please forgive me. So in this map, uh, in the bottom right-hand portion of this map, you have about 370 million Muslims. Now this number excludes Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Malaysia. Big numbers, just on this map. Now in the upper left-hand corner, you have Greece that has 11 million Christians, which means you have 370 million Muslims on the bottom right and 11 million Greeks that the United States is sworn to defend under its NATO treaty in the upper corner. And the only non-Muslim country, principal non-Muslim country between those two uh, forces is Israel. Now, to give you an even finer point to it, uh, we have what is really the Achilles heel of Europe, which is Cyprus, which has a million Christians. And I just have a map here of sort of a before and after, if God forbid something had happened to Israel, uh, the Achilles heel of Europe would be sitting right over there. Now everyone should be, we're in the UN, and uh, we should be fair, and everyone should be asking me a question. How are you conglomerating all of these Muslims into one number that is a militant number against Europe? And my answer is, I'm not doing it. Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey, a NATO country and supposedly a moderate Muslim, is doing it. For on September 13th, 2011, he said to a thronging Egyptian crowd, a Turkish Muslim alliance would form a force 150 million people strong, and we are substantially surrounding the Mediterranean. Now, if a moderate, quote unquote, like Prime Minister of Turkey, is saying this publicly, can you imagine what is in the mind of ISIS and all of the other extremists that are uh, rampant through the Middle East? Now, he also said on July 19th, Israel, the same Prime Minister of Turkey, who's now, I believe, President of Turkey, uh, he said, Israel surpasses Hitler in barbarism. Now, my belief is that these two statements are really two sides of the same coin. Now let's get to how does this relate to Israel, okay? This room was a little bit too big for me to show my topographic map of Israel, but I've put it up on the screen. And one of my favorite of all favorite events was about 21 years ago, I walked into the New York Times editorial board to give them a briefing on my map. And 
there were the editors that write on Israel in the room. And one of the editors points to the actual side of the Jordan River, which is the west bank of the Jordan River. And he says, he mocking me and laughing at me, he says, you're never going to be able to prove that that's strategic. And I said, you know, you're right. I'm not going to be able to prove that spot right, the West Bank, which is the West Bank of the Jordan River, is strategic. But that's not the West Bank we know and love to fight about. The actual West Bank, if you're looking up on the screen, is really the entire area up to the green line. So between the red line, which is the Jordan River, and the green line is a mountain range that's called the mountains of Samaria. The green line is where, in 1948-49, there was an armistice, and it was where Israel started out in the 67 war, and Israel captured all of these mountains. Okay? So what they're talking about when they talk about the West Bank is not a little bank on the side of the river. It's this entire mountain range. And it's not only a little mountain range. It's actually a mountain range where if you look at that blue patch, that blue patch, and by the way, from the right side to the, of the blue patch to the left side to the blue patch is about 10 miles. And north and south, it runs about 40 miles. So in that rectangle, is about 70% of Israel's population and 80% of her industrial base. Now, why is that so critical? Well, first of all, you can see that you've got a mountain range right sitting on top of Israel's population center. But this is really why it's absolutely the heart of the issue. Right now, Israel has been receiving fire from uh, the Gaza Strip. And basically, I'm going to show you two circles. Up to recently, this was the width of the missiles that were fired into Israel. These missiles, let's just say, they, just for simplicity's sake, they went roughly 20 kilometers or 12 miles. They carried about 40, 35 pounds of high explosive, okay? Now, the missiles are this wide. This is 302 millimeters. This, this was 122, and this is 302. These are the new things they're firing, okay? But this is the point. People will say, as Hannah Nashrawi did, uh, almost, I think, a week, week ago, she said, oh, they're homemade rockets. They don't cause any damage, okay? Now, what's been going on is they've been firing these rockets, and if you look at the, from the Gaza Strip, you will realize almost all the area around the Gaza Strip is relatively sparsely populated. It's mostly farmland, okay? So if you fire a rocket from North Dakota into one of these rockets from North Dakota into North Dakota, and no offense on North Dakota, if anyone's here from North Dakota, or anyone watching, uh, you're not likely to hit something. So they've fired, since, 19, uh, since 2000, maybe 20,000 rockets, like this. Okay. But this is the key. If they get and are, uh, are given the West Bank and fire the same 122s that are easily smuggleable and easily carryable, as I'm about to show you, it's not going to be like firing a mortar or a rocket from North Korea to North Korea. It's going to be like firing a rocket from Brooklyn into Manhattan. That's why the concentration issue is so great and why it really makes all the difference. And Sorry. Uh, what happened was I'm reading the paper this morning, and I see Yuval Steinitz, who's the intelligence minister. And he says, he says the following. 
If this repeats itself in Judea and Samaria, this becomes an existential threat. From there, thousands of short-range rockets with 20-kilometer ranges put Tel Aviv, Gush Dan, and Jerusalem into range. And he says, what constitutes a severe threat in Gaza becomes an existential threat from Judea and Samaria. That was in today's Jerusalem Post. So just to give everybody a uh, baseball card view of these rockets, I've uh, put a, a graphic over here. And you can see what used to be the older rocket, and now what's the new rocket. And I would, again, be remiss if I did not explain that Iran entitled these new rockets the Kaibar rocket, exactly because, as Gorgi spoke about, they are referring to the Battle of Kaibar, which occurred in 1629 on the Arabian Peninsula, where the Prophet Muhammad uh, killed... Uh, 629. What did I say? I'm, I'm sorry. 629. Uh, and as well as enslaved many people. Now, here's a map that what shows, and the, this is the key part, the new rockets put the rectangle into absolute range from the Gaza Strip. Now, one should understand exactly the depth of what we're dealing with. And one says, you're going to get rid of Hamas. Well, there was a, a poll that was published just about a week and a half ago. And it was a Palestinian poll, not an Israeli poll, by a Palestinian pollster. And this pollster determined that of about 1,200 adults in Gaza, that 88.9% of them support the firing of rockets from Gaza at Israel. Now, that's a, that is a scary situation. And one, again, I have a, a graphic of what exactly uh, this rocket looks like compared to a man. And one of the key differences between the Katusha and uh, this rocket is it can carry, oh, just as a point, remember the Katusha carries about 30 pounds of uh, explosive or warhead. This rocket carries 330 pounds of warhead and rocket. And this is what they were firing into Israel. And one of, one of the uh, possible variants of warhead is a fuel air explosive. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of it, except to say it is called a poor man's nuclear bomb for good reason. Now, how do these... Well, how do these rockets get there? Well, unfortunately, Israel is not just fighting Hamas. Israel is fighting Iran, Qatar, Turkey, and Hamas, and unfortunately, a great many of Hamas's supporters throughout the Middle East. And you could see where these rockets actually came because on March 5th of, last, of this year, Israel intercepted the Kloss C ship, which had 40, 40 of these rockets. Now, that could have very well have been the tipping point. If those 40 rockets had gotten into Gaza, maybe one of those rockets could have gotten through and caused absolute carnage in Israel. And when we're talking about... Uh, blockades and, and any type of interdiction... Israel isn't trying to stop uh, humanitarian and normal uh, foodstuffs and other uh, commerce from going into Gaza. They're trying to stop the 302s. That's why we have a problem. And again, just to give a comparison, one can see the Katusha on the left. And why is this so problematic? It's problematic because, again, if there were some type of Palestinian state, you would have to stop this small of a rocket from being used by determined terrorists. That is what Israel is up against in its peace process. 
And just to really explain the unfortunate weeds of this problem, these rockets don't just contain high explosive. They contain ball bearings. And what do ball bearings do? They don't kill people. They maim them, like this Jewish boy down on the left. And as a fact, katushas as well carry chemical weapons. Now, I talked about Israel's strategic value to Western Europe. I talked about the threat to uh, Israel from a West Bank Palestinian state. I'm now going to circle back to Defense Minister Ya'alon's quote to give a little bit of background to how Israel is not only protecting Western civilization, Israel is protecting moderate Muslims. Now, how? Well, first of all, in your materials, I have how I've derived this black gold triangle. But essentially, the, the short and the simple is underneath this triangle is 56% of the world's oil supply. And you don't need to be a, a genius to understand that this is what everyone is fighting about. This is what the Sunnis and the Shias and, the every, and ISIS is all fighting. This is where the gold is. And so the real issue is how is Israel protecting moderate Sunnis? Well, and by the way, moderate Druze, moderate Shia, really everybody who is interested in freedom in what I call Eastern theater. So I have a map. And I developed this 21 years ago. I was in a congressional office, and a congressman essentially said to me, can you explain to me why Israel is not the cause of instability? Because perhaps the biggest lie, it's the big lie, is that Israel is the cause of instability in the Middle East. That Israel is the cause of all of the problems. And when people say this, they are not just talking about Israel post-1967. Make no mistake. People who say Israel is the cause of instability of the Middle East are talking about Israel from 1948, Israel from 1925, Israel from whenever. So this has nothing to do with the green line or not green line. So I tried to explain to him you know, where Israel was on the map, and I could see he really didn't understand the map very well. So on the way home, I made a simple map. And I said, well, okay, God forbid something happens to Israel. Let's game it out. And I said, the first thing is Lebanon and independent Lebanon. Hasn't been. Will never be. God forbid something happens to Israel. What's going to happen? you're going to get a little bit of a bigger Syria, Hezbollah, Iran to the north, and a little bit of a bigger Egypt to the south. That's it. Next, Israel has been protecting Jordan for 50 years from Assad and now from ISIS. Could anyone imagine if Jordan had to worry about ISIS not only from the east, but from a western Palestinian state that turns into a Hamas Palestinian state. So the second map shows Jordan goes down. And then all of a sudden, you see what the real problem is. If those two things happen, then what have you got? You've got Saudi Arabia under threat from God only knows how many ways. So in effect, what this maps show is Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and any moderate Muslim in this arc actually has a vested interest in keeping Israel safe and secure. So now, in conclusion, anti-Zionism of today will lead to terrible, terrible catastrophe for the world tomorrow, both in the Islamic world as well as the European world. And I would be remiss if I didn't go back to the map and say not only does this map project 
West and actually show Arabia, but Israel protects Africa as well. So uh, that's my presentation. I want to again thank His Excellency Dr. Otto. You are, uh, you are my angel. And I want to thank everyone who came and Gorgie, God bless you. And thank you, everyone.